everyone and welcome here to an all new edition of the Dolphin Dive which is exclusive to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora inside of our exclusive multimedia marketing partnership with the Lemoyne College Dolphins here on the Heights. I'm very happy and very much appreciate the fact that Tracy Roman, the head coach of the softball team, is joining me here today to spotlight not only her team, but her journey and her story. Tracy, how are you? I'm good, how are you, Dan? Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely, and I'm happy to have you here. Now, softball, I kinda wanna start in my connection to softball and see what you think about this. So, coaching-wise, uh, at my alma mater, Marywood University, we I took a coaching class, and in order to get your credits, we had to learn two different sports learn how to kind of coach them, play them, and whatnot. The two sports that they chose were basketball, which I played my whole life, and softball. So I had to learn the game in order to pass the course. What does it mean to you that a coaching class that could have been about any sport in the world chose softball? Because we always talk about the fact that softball should get a little bit more love out there. So to know that you get to learn the game and, and that that's something that some colleges and universities really hone in on just what that means. I think that's actually pretty cool. I mean, what I'm hearing right now is that you'd be available to be a volunteer assistant on our staff. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, I think it's cool uh, that they chose softball because, you know, a lot of times we're kind of, you know, baseball's little sister or whatnot, and we get a lot of people um, with a baseball background that don't understand some of the little nuances that make our sports different um, yeah. and it is you know our sports gaining popularity on TV you know it, it's much more publicized now and, and visible than when I, I played certainly but I think that's pretty awesome it's just it means it's a sign of growth for our sport yeah you know and, and to and that's where I wanted to really bring it to lead off is where softball has been and where you think it is where have we come over the years well in my experience playing at the University of Massachusetts um, I was very fortunate to play for my mentor, Elaine Sortino, um, who is a Hall of Fame coach, and uh, she always, she taught us what Title IX was all about, and even though we, you know, the field we played on back then would be comparable to a high school field now, um, I didn't know, we never knew fields like Oklahoma City, where the World Series are held, even existed until we got to the World Series, so we never felt like we went without, but um, certainly you're seeing salaries increase for coaches, you're seeing budget lines increase, there's been a lot of increases, um, more full-time positions for, for coaching staff. Um, but yeah, we've improved, like I just mentioned, there's a lot of visibility on TV now. Uh, years ago I, I played in two World Series and only the championship game was on there and now, you know, the whole thing is visible. So it's, it's great for the youth of, of America and, and, and just the sport in general. What is it about the sport that you feel made that transition to make sure that there's more than just the end result that's going to be televised because it's not the only sport that's played in America by women that used to be, we'll show you the championship, but we're not going to show you the road up there. So why do you think there's been more of a desire to see softball? I think when softball became more visible as far as being televised, uh, we pulled, we were able to pull a lot of baseball fans who like the game because it tends to move, uh, you know, quite a bit quicker yeah. than some baseball games can go. Um, that's that's one of the things I've heard, uh, the shorter park, there's more uh, of a speed game involved, but we, we can hit, you know, with power too and people always, whether it's softball or baseball, love to see the long ball. So um, just, yeah, I think that visibility has really helped the sport to grow and um, it's the, the scene at the club level has just exploded with teams. Training a pitcher in softball, how would you describe the little intricate nuances? Because there are some incredible, incredible pitchers that as you said, you know, you could pull some people over that are baseball fans, but you can pull people that don't even watch baseball because of how, I mean, at least for me personally, how the ball will leave the hand, hit the mitt, and I'm like, where'd it go? So, I mean, there's something to be said about the softball pitching world, and I would love to get your thoughts on kind of the intricacies of that. It's, yeah, I mean, it's very detailed, and um, you deal with a lot of different spins. You know, of course, we have an underhand delivery versus an overhand delivery. Um, and we don't pitch off the mound, we have more, you know, it's a circle, so there's a little bit of difference. But yeah, the spin's um, very comparable to what baseball can do, but we do have a rise ball, which is an upspin. You don't see that in baseball as much. But yeah, the, the pitcher, 
you don't have much of a team if you don't have good pitching. And I think that's true with, with both of our sports. And um, But yeah, that's that's half the battle. You know, one of the biggest adjustments we have to make in, in, the, in the spring season is we throw on turf when we're practicing and then to make the transition outside as we did last weekend to dirt, you know, it can throw the pitcher's timing off a little bit. It's, you know, one of the adjustments us Northeast schools have to make a little bit early <laughs> in the season. So, uh, yeah, it's very, um, very detail oriented. And you have to have kids that really want to work on that and love those little nuances um, to make that, that ball break. How do you help in the transition from practicing on turf to then going out to the dirt? What have you done to try and alleviate some of the, you know, maybe greater changes you know like you said for a pitcher to walk out there I mean what can a coach do to say we're going to practice and play on two totally different surfaces how do you how do you handle that and make that an advantage maybe or, or how do you how do you deal with the change well I think it's all in being a good salesperson of course you got to pitch it to the <laughs> team like it's no big deal yeah. uh, Lincoln Memorial last week we were their 23rd game um, it was our fourth game of the season and and yeah that's difficult because they've had you know some of those teams that have the advantage of the nice weather uh, can iron some things out a little quicker than we can but I think we just try to remember that um, we're in it for the long haul and we might take some beatings a little bit at the beginning but it's not how you start it's more how you finish and just getting your group to play well at the right time but no you, you as a coach you try to spit it and just get them to focus on the things that we can control and and just practicing uh, you know a level of gratefulness that we're even out there and, and able to take some of those preseason trips where a lot of other schools in our conference whether they're not budgeted for it or they don't do the fundraising for it aren't able to even have those opportunities to go south so although we might take our lumps we're still grateful that we get to go down there and do that so um, and I just try to relay it too with as far as the game differences um, and the number of games all of these kids played travel ball or club ball and I just said, you know, you never walked up and wondered, you know, how many games your opponent had played. It's like the game doesn't change. So just get out there and compete and, and do the best you can. And, and we'll, you know, iron things out as we need to. And when you went down to your most recent classic there, you had the opportunity down south to play University of Alabama in Huntsville. Yes. Really? You had uh, Embry-Riddle and you had uh, the game that you just mentioned here with Lincoln Memorial. What did you learn from that? Because obviously... Um, ERs typically you would think a top a top 25 ranked team and then Lincoln Memorial was ranked in the top 25 when you played them and so is the University of Alabama and Huntsville so what do those games do for you to play that level of competition especially this early on in the season? You know I grew up in Syracuse and uh, when I was a kid Lemoyne was a premier program in the country for softball um, and I'm very aware of that and my goal and part of my goal in taking this job is to get Lemoyne back to the national stage. So I really believe that you have to play the best if you want to be the best. And it's my goal to always seek out the best competition that we can because I want our kids competing and making adjustments based on high level competition versus fighting teams that maybe we could, you know, beat up a little bit and, and um, get our stats up. But, you know, is it really helping us to grow? So I really seek out these challenges. The kids love it. And I think it's, it's going to pay dividends. We just got to keep battling. What did you learn from those games? I learned that we have pitching that can take us uh, quite a ways. I mean, Laura Bennett is just solid uh, in, in the circle. She held uh, the number 17 and number 18 team in the country, you know, with a one ERA, 1.0 ERA, which is pretty good. She was dealing and, you know, our hitting is far ahead. Um, we have a lot more power and speed this year. So I, I think our hitting is in a better place, you know, once we get some more at bats. It's just we got to clean up some things defensively, which is common early in the season when you're not outside and, and having the good fortune of, of practicing on dirt. So, you know, these early little things we want to find out now and, and make adjustments. But, the few, you know, I, I was pleased, even though the results of the, the win-loss column may not always reflect, you know, where we're going. And that was something that you and I talked about off the air, is seeing beyond the win-loss column to what this can do for the team. And like you pointed out, there was a lot of positives that you took away from the opportunity of playing these teams, you had also stated that being a part of this program and, and taking over this program and being the head coach, you remember the history of Lemoyne softball and you want to get them back to the national stage. What is it about the program right now that makes you feel like they can get back there? 
Well, I think you have to have a combination of talent. You, you certainly need a little luck and you need to remain, you know, keep your injuries at bay. But, you know, what's what's unique about, about the Division II level, there's such discrepancies in money, Division I, um, from one Division I program to the next. Division II, there's a lot of parity. Um, so you really feel like you can build something from the ground up and, and get to the national stage. Uh, it just takes time. You know, COVID certainly prohibited some of our recruiting efforts initially when I first took the job. but. Um, no, it's it's fun to watch it grow and just and to see how we can get back up there. Something that's changed now versus 25, 20 years ago when I was in college is I think programs are more equally funded. Um, so you're seeing schools get caught up, by, you know, by way of Title IX, and uh, a lot of programs are competitive. Like in the NE10, there are no gimme games. There are no easy games. There's no team that you go into knowing that you're just gonna, you know. <laughs> wipe them out one day. Every, every every game is tough. Every game you have to be prepared for and you can't take anybody for granted, that's for sure. Chasey Roman here in this edition of Dolphin Dive on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora inside of our exclusive multimedia marketing partnership with Lemoyne and focusing here on Lemoyne's softball team. You spoke about Division Two and the parody. You also mentioned Division One and that there's discrepancies there. There is the conversation and has been the conversation for almost a year now of a potential shift to D1. How would you view that as the head coach of the softball program if Lemoyne were to make that move? You know, at the end of the day, I'm a coach and I'm going to come coach no matter if we're Division 1, 2, 3, ABC, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, I think right now we're very comparable uh, competitively to a mid-major Division I program. Are we going to go out and compete with the Power 5 schools? Probably not. Um, but to me, it's, you know, I'm not in charge of what my employer decides might be in the best business interest of the entire organization or college. So I'm going to come in and do my job to the best of my ability and, and still do whatever we can to put W's up on the board. And when you took over, like you said, going through COVID and that affects recruiting to take over this program and almost immediately have to deal with something that most people have not dealt with in hundreds of years. <laughs> how, how did you navigate through that? I think like everybody else did, just, you know, one day at a time and figuring out things as, as we went. You know, I, I got on campus the end of October 2019, so we were already a little delayed in, in how I would have hoped to start a year. But then, you know, we were down in Florida when COVID hit and the NBA shut down and the world seemed to kind of stop. So just getting back here and then figuring out, hey, how do, how do I coach? you know, through a computer screen. And I just think we all did the best we could to, to navigate through it and took advantage of opportunities and really learned to be grateful for the things that we did have. And um, I don't think any of us were pre pre prepared for how quickly life could change as we knew it. And um, I think there's a great lesson in that. We still remind ourselves of that. But no, I think just like everybody else, just put one foot in front of the other and kind of made it up as we went and, and just did the best that we could. How did you become a better recruiter having to recruit so uniquely and virtually? Like you said, you had to become a coach on a screen. Yeah, I think um, recruiting is so much about relationships. Yeah. And yes, as a coach, you want to get out and see those kids play, but it really forced you to focus in more than maybe you would have. I mean, you're always looking to build relationships, but I mean, that was the telephone and texting and email and FaceTime, all those uh, avenues that we weren't maybe utilizing as much as we could have. Now we have kids that want to jump on, you know, FaceTime calls more than just talking on the phone. So yeah. there's it definitely, I think, some good came from it. Um, but nothing, nothing beats getting to see a kid out on the field. There's just some intangibles that you're not going to be able to see on a screen. But you know, you can build those relationships and at least get started and see, you know, if it's a mutual fit for both. Why do you? like you said, appreciating these things going through COVID and all of that. What do you, like you talked about, there's nothing like seeing a kid on the field. Do you remind yourself of that when you're out there now and life feels more normal? Do you kind of just pinch yourself and say, hey, I couldn't do this for a little while. So if I'm tired, if it's hot, if it's cold, whatever's going on, like I, I need to remember the blessing of being here. Do you kind of catch yourself in the moment and say, hey, Tracy, this is pretty cool that you get to do this. Yeah, you know, it's easy, I think, no matter what line of work you're in, it's easy to 
um, jump into the negative part of it sometimes when the chaos sort of catches up with you. But yeah, I think we all have to take uh, you know some time to reflect at times, especially when we're overwhelmed and pull back the reins a little bit and be like, wait a minute, I, I'm a coach. I get to, you know, I get to coach kids for my job. And yeah. Um, yeah, some days are really tough, but most of the days are really great. And before we jump into something, because you and, you and I haven't gotten to play rapid fire. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we will do that. But I want to go to a couple off camera here. You have some signs and they've stuck out to me when I came in here and saw these. One of them says, I'm not saying I'm Wonder Woman. I'm just saying that no one has ever seen me and Wonder Woman in the same room. <laughs> Why do you have that up on your desk? Listen, I love Wonder Woman. I had, uh, you know, underwear. I don't know if you remember Underoos as a kid, yeah. but like, I had, uh, Wonder Woman was my girl, and I, you know, I just think she's awesome. She's, you know, classy, elegant, and in and, and one hand, and then she's, you know, she's a beast out there, and she gets after it. So, you know, who wouldn't want to be Wonder Woman? So. Yeah, I just like to leave that sign up as a reminder that maybe, you know, maybe not. You just never know where Wonder Woman is. <laughs> I like that. I also like the one that says, take the high road, it's less crowded. Yeah, that was really something, you know, I, I grabbed that. That was a Hobby Lobby grab. It was something my head coach said all the time. You know, I think it's easy to get caught up in the noise. And especially when you're a coach, you're always, you know, you're not going to be everybody's best friend. People aren't going to agree with you. People aren't even going to like you a lot of the times and um, I think with social media and stuff now it's so easy to just snap back and um, so I think about my coach coach Sortino all the time when um, I'm you know you maybe want to do something that's not appropriate or not classy it's just you know take the high road and you know your actions kind of speak louder than words and um, there's some fights that just aren't worth engaging in because they're not winnable fights and they're just distractions from what you're trying to accomplish so and you and I talked about this and I'm gonna go back to it something that I posted and uh, you and I had a conversation about it. It's in, and people that know on Instagram at wake up call underscore DT, I try to any message I put up that I create myself, I sign them individually. If they don't want to know you while you build, there's no reason to have them at your housewarming party. Why did you take that one as well? Well, the quote, it really resonated with me because I, I think it's tough, especially in the world of athletics where you're really measured on wins and losses. Um, I, I think it's easy to find a lot of company when you're winning and sometimes it can get a little quiet, a little eerily quiet when you're not, you know, winning or you're losing, you're just not doing well and that's true in life too. And I think you really have to pay attention to the people that are there, good and bad, who's supporting you, the people that are reaching out to you when things aren't going as well. Um, you know, I tell the team all the time that no matter if we're winning or losing, I call that noise too, the distractions outside. Nobody's going to believe in our group as much as, you know, the 22 people right there. So yeah. you kind of have to look inward and, and kind of just keep all that outside distraction away and just, you know, like I said, actions will speak for themselves. You just got to keep doing the work. Yeah, that's very true. So with that being said, rapid fire. I'm not going to put you on the hot seat because you've answered all my questions <laughs> so well, elegantly as Wonder Woman shall. <laughs> so you can put me on the hot seat. Three questions, rapid fire, can be about anything, sports related, non-sports related, but you got three questions, you get to run the show for the next three. Okay, so what made you get into the industry that you're working in now? Well, since I was five, I, I mean as far back as I can remember doing it, my dad had a word processor. And so it's a typewriter with this little screen, and you could actually see what you were writing, which was in like like the Mercedes of typewriters. And so I would get up on a Saturday morning, I'd climb up on a chair, my dad would set it up, he'd go outside and do some work, and I would create a story. Uh, always had the imagination, always loved to tell stories, and I always loved to write them and then immediately share them with somebody. So that spreading goodness, spreading my faith, my belief in God. I love comedy, I love making people laugh daily. So between comedy, storytelling, faith, goodness, and I realized in the media pretty quickly that there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lack of love in a lot of ways. And you know, if you tell the truth in the media, you're probably a point zero 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 one percenter. So being an honest person is important to me and you know, as, as you and I have spoken about and you just spoke about, uh, sometimes you could do everything right, you could be the kindest person in the world and someone could stab you in the back. 
Yeah. I will always have your back. I won't stab it. Yeah, well, that's, that's great. It's good to know. Um, an interesting take, too, with your father there and how you got started. Uh, my other question would be is I see that you do um, kind of work for, work with, or collaborate with many, many food places mm -hmm. locally in the area. Yeah. Uh, what do you like covering better? Like, you know, some of the colleges <laughs> that you do or the food, the food, uh, the businesses, small businesses, it seems like you're, you're pretty big on. Well, I, I think the cool thing is that they all kind of give to each other. It allows me to be, in order for me to wake up every day and, you know, be who I want to be, I love that no day is ever the same. And being, being me is always like imagination, having fun, seeing people succeed. So shooting, you know, I, I just I went to Cafe Kubal, they changed their menu. And I went through the drive-thru with my dog, and I shot a video with her and I going through the drive-thru. So it's stuff like that, and, and then it's, you know, sitting on a couch and getting to tell your story and, and knowing that you're not the only person out there that wants softball to have more of a spotlight, and then feeling how personal that is to you and how much it means to me that it's now in my brain at all times, like, let's make sure that we make you know get it out there and, and we make sure that you and your team feel is represented so I can't say I could pick a favorite they're all different but the thing that strings them all together is I get to learn about people and I'd like to think they trust me and they let me tell their story and then the world gets to learn that everybody has a story and you know from one redheaded stepchild to the next I, I was not always treated with the greatest respect or given the most opportunity so I like to do the opposite and I like to make someone say you know I've had coaches come up to me and say nobody cares about my program or a player that said I, I played like you know two minutes a game why would you want to talk to me I love when they come on the show and I treat them exactly the same as a Hall of Famer and in a lot of cases probably all of them those stories end up being like the most inspirational ones is like the story from the walk-on which is crazy yeah, there's nothing better than a good underdog story. And there's so many people that want to tell their story and they think they're not worthy. Mm -hmm. And I love flipping the script on that. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's great. You're now, the last one. is somebody that's on social media all the time just trying to plug things, yeah. which one, and you have to pick one, mm -hmm. would you say you, you feel like you reach the most people and why? Which social media? Which platform? I would probably say, and it frustrates me because every time something works on there, they change it. And it's <laughs> so annoying is Facebook. But, you know, because we go live on Facebook and sometimes it'll work for six months and then my computer's like, no, we're not going to do it. Because <laughs> Facebook upgraded or up changed. Now I don't want to say upgraded, they changed something. So I would say, you know, we've reached so many people that way and you know I without Facebook I wouldn't know my third and fifth grade teachers like follow my work right which to me is makes me feel like I've done something in my life right um, but yeah I mean I Twitter works for me <laughs> but it is such a food fight and I tell people when you create a Twitter account you put your hand out they hand you mashed potatoes and you can either throw them in the trash or throw them at somebody <laughs> That's Twitter. And then Instagram, I, I think, you know, I never thought in a million years, number one, I was going to use it. Number two, because we have so many different shows and they're all on there, that, uh, that just posting my feelings for the day and a quote that inspires me and hoping it inspires somebody else, mm -hmm. like in the case when you and I did that, and signing them, I never thought that, like, people would, like, they jump right on it. And if I don't post anything for, like, an hour or two, the first thing I put on my story, it's like immediate. And so I would like to think that people are kind of like, hopefully like, hey Dan, like, you know, what's the positive word today? Yeah. So I would say they all work in their own way. YouTube's great. Uh, but Facebook probably has allowed me to really build relationships with people that I had no idea were supporting me. Yeah. 
should say that. I agree, and the only reason I ask too partially is because we have to use social media so often, but I have a 19-year-old and a 17-year-old that make fun of me <laughs> for being on Facebook, but it's like, that's where my people are. But yeah. certainly the cater and, and recruit to what we're doing here, Instagram and, and Twitter are a big deal too, but it just feels like when you learn how to use one of them, another different kind pops up and yeah. we're starting all over again. <laughs> yeah, and, and TikTok, I uh, just, I, I there's, I have to at some point draw the line of how many platforms we're on. We do have it, but the you know I, I, I sent an inspirational video out and it did well. And then I sent out a video of me microwaving soda and it did incredibly well. <laughs> and that made me question everything about American society. And is that a platform you really want to be on? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I so, understand completely. <laughs> so with that being said, for Tracy Roman, myself, Dan Tortora, this has been a special edition of Dolphin Dive, diving in to Tracy's story as well as the story of the Lemoyne Dolphin softball team. Final word you get, which is why should the community support your team? You know, we have a great group of 20 kids who really strive to do a good job in the classroom. Um, they're out volunteering. We've, we've done over a thousand community service hours since the beginning of the academic year. So these are kids that are not only fantastic softball players, can be very competitive players out there, but just really, really great people, um, good people for our community that are doing great things. So I think they're fun to watch and we love interacting with the community, especially when we have younger players come out to the game. So. Um, you know, I think I think it's a great opportunity, you know, for people to meet some really great human beings. Tracy Roman, myself, Dan Tortora. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks, Appreciate Dan. it. We'll talk with you all soon, and make sure you're always with us during Dolphin Time, Wednesdays at 9 a.m. And all throughout, you can, of course, go to wakeupcalldt.com to the Lemoyne tab and see our entire library of Lemoyne content. We appreciate you, and as always, we leave you with three things. God bless, no stress. Do your best. We'll talk soon. Take care. Thank you.